Hi everyone, thanks for joining our Epneta webinar today. We're talking today about how IT can get control of SaaS application performance to avoid failure and end user issues. So let's get started with a couple of introductions. I'm Christine Signoli, I'm the content manager here at Epneta. I'm here with Alec Pinkham, who's with our product marketing team. Um, so here's a quick overview, if you look at the agenda, of what we'll be talking about today. We'll run through some of IT's challenges, and then we'll get to some of the tips that we like to share on IT taking back control of SaaS and cloud applications. Um, then we'll run into a quick overview of how Epneta can help and wrap up with your questions. So just a couple of logistics here. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will send the recording out to everyone who signed up and we'll also post it on our website. You can check out our past webinars at appneta.com, um, navigate to the resources section. This webinar will also be up there the next day or so. And make sure to feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar using the questions feature and go to webinar. So we'll answer as many as we can as we go. We'll also save a couple of minutes at the end for your questions. Um, we expect the webinar to last about half an hour today so you can plan accordingly. All right, Alec, take it away. Great, uh, so here's our problem. Uh, IT is often you know, stuck in the middle when it comes to SaaS apps. So you know, one of these is, you know, the frustrated application user, the other is the application provider's help desk. So someone from Microsoft, Salesforce, Google, or someone else. Uh, it doesn't really matter which side is which. What really matters is that IT is stuck in the middle of this kind of endless game of telephone between the, uh, the provider and the users when issues arise. And so the idea behind adopting, you know, SaaS applications, public cloud instances, and all that was to simplify uh, some of this communication by offloading some of the infrastructure. But now that we have less hardware and software to manage, we've traded actually an ownership problem for a visibility one. Uh, so a, what is probably obvious is that your goal is not to be Homer Simpson here, get out of the middle and get everything working in harmony so that you can actually enjoy the benefits of SaaS and cloud. So on one side of IT, we do have the rock, right? Moving just one important application to the cloud can be a big deal for IT, uh, let alone multiple apps. So along with the user transition to a new app, uh, IT may run into other roadblocks they hadn't expected during the switch, right? One recent survey from Zscaler looked at the challenges of just one popular SaaS app, so uh, Office 365 in this case. Almost 80% of the IT decision makers are using or planning to use Office 365, right? It is prevalent, but 70% of businesses already using it report latency on a weekly basis, and over 30% report latency daily. And the majority of Office 365 users have weekly bandwidth issues uh, that can be attributed to Office 365. So they have these issues even after performing network upgrades, right? And at the crux of this issue, nearly half of the survey respondents uh, said that the cost of upgrades to, to support Office 365 was more than they had anticipated. And so we've heard of you know, firewalls and proxies swamped by the persistent connections of Office, Office 365. And, and that's just one application, you know, granted it's a big one with a lot of services, but it's one out of the many that you're probably supporting. And, you know, for a lot of businesses, it may be the first test of shifting an entire on-premises on -premises application suite to the cloud. Uh, and it's proving more complicated than we kind of all originally believed. Right. So what compounds the problem is that today's professional culture has led to widespread network endpoints, you know, from new offices to the work from home culture on any given day. Uh, you know, for any given help desk ticket, you likely don't know the entire path uh, that the application has traveled to reach the user. So, you know, many of these networks are in the mix, right? The LAN, the WAN, an MPLS network, uh, public internet, VPN tunnels, and the cloud or SaaS provider network that's oftentimes load balanced or uh, using software defined networking. So multiple locations may also be involved, right? The user's location, the SaaS provider's hosting location, data centers, offices. And this is some serious complexity, right? IT is now the broker of services. So you're stuck between the users and the applications and you're responsible for the performance, but you don't actually have direct control. So we have a few tips to talk about. Uh, Christine, what do we have first? Yeah, thanks, Alec. So our first recommendation is that you know who's involved in your modern IT infrastructure. So in the past, IT owned and controlled every user application and the hardware that it ran on. But as you know, they don't anymore. So important applications can be deployed entirely without IT. SaaS applications are really easy to find and use, and employees really just need a credit card to get started. 
um, cloud services similarly are easy to use and they're really popular. So that just adds another layer of complexity. Um, and both of these markets continue to grow. So in a recent roundup from Forbes of uh, cloud computing predictions, one finding was that cloud spending is growing more than six times the rate of IT spending through 2020. Um, 74 percent of CFOs say that cloud computing will have the most measurable impact on their business this year. Um, another complicating factor is that businesses are opening a lot of new remote locations. So just one study from Enterprise Management Associates found that 83 percent of businesses are adding WAN connected remote sites. Ella, can you tell us a little bit more about um, actually fixing the problems? Uh, yeah, so uh, you know the ownership issue is getting a bit more complex as spend increases outside the IT organization. So typically you'll have to you'll have to do some digging to understand who's in charge of what. Uh, and with the best view into the network, you'll be able to triage quicker than you know a non-technical app owner as to whether or not an issue is something you can fix or something you need to escalate. So you know whether the app ends up under IT's control or not, knowing the owner and something around the app itself, and you know the needs of the application, uh, that will aid you in the network monitoring and capacity planning efforts in the future. You know one of our customers, St. Luke's Healthcare, has actually spent time streamlining support and communications with their primarily non-technical application owners, so across different offices, but also across uh, you know uh, hospitals and a bunch of different groups and departments. Uh, so to ensure that they keep an eye on these apps, they've set up test accounts to each SaaS app, uh, Workday, Cornerstone, and, and a few others. And they've trained these app owners to actually on how to take the first step in addressing performance issues when they arise. Right? It's not going to you're not going to teach them how to troubleshoot a network, but where can they go to see maybe a dashboard, or where can they go to see whether or not it's something that they can control? And, and as a result, these app owners have actually stopped blaming every issue on the network, and you know by definition, the networking team because of it. So with several hundred remote locations in play at St. Luke's, uh, you know, getting application owners standardized with a support process was actually a really big and important step. And it saved a ton of time for their team uh, just to get everyone kind of on the same page of what what the process was and what the steps were. Uh, so, you know, it, you know, you can take some time, but if nothing else, like create something super simple like a Google Sheet uh, that can help you keep a list of the applications, the application owners. And, you know, and other info like ports, protocols, subscription terms, it, it's going to help you when you set up a new location, but it's also going to set like set kind of a, a groundwork for what you need to know uh, going forward when new apps are brought on board. And so, you know, the other part here is, you know, we're, we're going to be interspersing some of the some of our technology in here because, uh, you know, that's part of the reason we, we, you know, expose these webinars is to get people understanding like how we look at things. You know, identifying the applications on the network is important because it gives you a heads up as to what you need to be monitoring, right? Keeping up with this kind of changing landscape of applications is definitely hard, but you can do it by keeping an eye on the traffic, right? Identifying the apps and categorizing them as you go instead of kind of doing a, you know, bi-monthly or quarterly type effort to try to figure out what apps are in play. So Abneta's, uh, you know, our application usage monitoring uses a deep packet inspection engine to identify over 2,000 applications, uh, and that's changing daily. You can also customize these. Uh, many people are familiar with something like NBAR2 from Cisco uh, that looks at NetFlow records, but the issue with NetFlow data is that it's it's sampled and it's running uh, it's running this application identification engine that is a little bit older, and it's focused on kind of the old on-premise or old web apps that you host in a data center and not the changing landscape of SaaS apps. And so we also, you know, we'll look at ports, protocols, sources, and destinations to match every app that we can, um, but we'll let you define the custom ones as well. And this makes it much easier to look at traffic by location or different categories like, uh, you know, this chart here actually is sorted only to recreational traffic on the top. And Google Hangouts may be your preferred video conferencing, in which case you can kind of redefine this as business critical. Um, but when it comes to, you know, being able to see this, like you want to know what locations are experiencing problems and what locations are actually using these apps. So when it comes to knowing the players, you, you should be keeping your own list, um, but also monitoring what's in use. Because you know maybe a new app pops up that you haven't seen before or isn't on your list. And without this type of visibility, you'll likely get you know complaints and tickets about that app, but you may not know it exists until now. So I, I hope that covers it, Christine. Yeah, thanks, Alec. 
So our second recommendation is that IT teams stay on top of SaaS licensing, licensing and pricing. So SaaS and cloud applications usually come out of a different budget than IT's apps may have come out of before, and they're usually paid for differently than those on-premises applications are paid for. So as we're seeing more applications shift to subscription models, IT has to continue to own these services because they are still part of IT. Um, so software today is often licensed per user, and the cost is part of operating expenses. So a business will pay a monthly subscription fee instead of buying an application for three years, say. Um, the benefits, obviously, it's more flexible. It's based on real-time needs. If you need to add or drop users, you might be able to do it for the next month's billing cycle. Um, so the licensing of these apps and cloud provider instances can be complicated. So on top of IT already needing to get up to speed on how payment and licensing works, um, it will really help you to know the basics of licensing. It should also benefit you if you have a sense of how the cost of SaaS and cloud applications are handled internally with your purchasing teams. So and one other shift we're seeing is that IT sees that business leaders need to hear more from them about how they're cutting costs and how they might be justifying the software subscriptions or the cloud usage that they're um, using to support users. Uh, cool. So in, in order to kind of, get, kind of get through that, you know, first of all, the dimensions with which you're charged for SaaS apps uh, should match uh, how you use the product or how you think about the software. So if value is determined by the number of people, then per user licensing can be good. You know, if value comes from the number of tests uh, that you're running, then usage can work. But, you know, let's get into a couple of these and just talk about them. Per user licensing takes the number of users at a, of an application at face value, right? So if 10 employees in finance get 10 licenses, you can do that by machine or you can do it concurrent users. Um, many vendors will create packages of users that scales for larger enterprise uh, by costing, you know, less per user for larger groups of users or, you know, buckets. Uh, so definitely pay attention to that. But however, I, I encourage you to look at how the licensing plans, like deals would scale. If you add or lose a bunch of users through, you know, company changes, uh, are you able to scale up? Or conversely, are you stuck paying more for fewer users than you intended until the end of your contract year, right? Another way to think about this is usage-based licensing. Uh, it's gained popularity uh, mainly due to things like AWS and cloud pricing, just because you're uh, you're able to license your your infrastructure without sacrificing the flexibility to kind of scale uh, to demand. And with uh, load balancers and you know auto escalation, auto uh, turn on, you can you can do a lot with that today. But the downside of this model is that you do also you, you can pay for that inconsistency. So you may need to test a theory or want to enable better benchmarking coverage. Uh, and that's going to cost you, right? Big issue this month, escalated up the chain, required more testing, right? That's going to cost you too. And so it all adds up and budgets, budgets don't always kind of accommodate that as well. And, and you know, there are other models here. They're based on uh, the product or solution. Uh, and they're, they're based on kind of some dimension that makes sense for the software. Uh, but make sure it's something that makes sense to you in the sense that it aligns with value. So one example, you know, one of the dimensions that have Netta segments on is the number of locations because each one that you need actually provides value, right? It's an endpoint to represent some network edge that you want to monitor from or to, right? And, you know, finally, when you're budgeting uh, for any of these models, really uh, determine what is the scale factor, right? What changes in your company will force you to buy more or less of this product? Uh, you know, predict somewhere around 10 to 20 percent if you're growing uh, so that you know what might happen to the budget when you grow as well. Uh, you know, Christine, I hope this kind of addresses some of the con you know, concerns that he has around uh, licensing models. And we can definitely talk about that if anyone has any more questions. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Alec. So our third tip, and this is one we really cannot say enough, and we hear this about this issue from, um, from our customers all the time, is that you have to make sure you have SLAs with all of your providers and know generally what's in them. So that might be a lot of fine print, but it's really worth knowing what to expect when a problem comes up. So you're depending on these providers now to run huge parts of your business. So you need to have an idea of what will happen if their app goes down or if it has a recurring problem, and you'll really want that in writing. So, but what we're, we see so much is that it's still pretty common to find incomplete SLAs. SLAs should really be about performance. Um, so any service level agreement should go beyond whether the application is up or down. 
especially these days, you know, there's a lot more application slowdowns than actual outages like there used to be. And there are a lot of potential root causes for those slowdowns. So Alec, can you give us some of the best practices around the SLAs? Yep. So, you know, availability is the first step. Uh, it, it, it kind of has been the first step most to offer it, but it is limited. You know, AWS expresses it in, you know, minutes or seconds per year that you're down and, and it's gotten a lot better. But once you've ensured your SLA has your best interests in mind in terms of availability, you can move on to other uh, particularly like more important clauses in the agreement. And I think this is something that uh, not all companies offer. So you do have to ask for, um, but something like the mean time to respond or repair from your service provider. So your SLA should include some specifics about when the service provider will respond to disruptions. Uh, this is typically broken into tiers of severity, uh, but make sure you have a say in determining the definitions of those tiers uh, so that you have a clear path for escalation, right? Every time you take an application out of your data center in favor of a SaaS platform, you, you, you sacrifice a certain level of control, right? One consequence is that you can't call your in-house system admin for any of the troubleshooting scenarios, right? Instead, you're often left to call the service provider's contact center, uh, but you want to really use your SLA to define an escalation path and tiering that gets you in contact with a manager when you need to, or uh, it gets you to the service provider and so that they essentially can quickly address your issues and make sure that you actually get, uh, get changes in place. Uh, another one here is data ownership. So ownership of cloud data. Uh, when you've implemented a cloud service, it's easy to grow kind of so comfortable with it. That you feel you have a sense of ownership. However, some service providers, especially in a licensing scenario, will limit what you can do with the data collected through its platform. Um, make sure there's an API, right? Check and see if your SA allows you to use that the kind of the data the way that you expect to. Uh, software security, uh, there's an inherent understanding that your service provider will take ownership of system infrastructure and security. However, you might want your SLA to include the right to audit uh, that security and compliance uh, just to make sure that your company's protected, right? That should be in there somewhere. Uh, and, and finally here, you know, disaster recovery, right? Availability is one thing, but your SLA should clearly detail how the provider will react to a worst case scenario, right? Make sure they've thought about this. Even the best availability guarantees can be diminished by you know, inefficient disaster recovery plans. Uh, but, but ultimately, we're trying to get to an SLA on performance. We need something that is not just an up-down check of availability. We need it to be a performance SLA. And yes, there are ISPs involved. There are MPLS providers between you and this service. But at the same time, you should be able to get some kind of performance metrics in this SLA. And so that's what we really want to push for. Uh, so while availability is what we have today, we really do want to get to performance. And Alec, we have a, uh, just a quick question about this slide from um, one of our attendees, which is, do you think that that's possible? They're sort of like, is it, is it possible to get, um, have a provider get to performance? Are we heading in that direction? Do you have a, a sense of that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely difficult, right? It, it's definitely by provider. It really depends on what they're, what they're willing to concede. And I think, you know, if you're a big enough customer, you, you're going to have more weight in that discussion. If you are... Uh, if you're using it as, you know, kind of the intended purposes, they may be able to work with you on that. Uh, but I think, you know, the best product teams are going to want some of that performance data. And they're, if they're monitoring kind of the performance and the user experience of their app, they should care about the performance that's perceived on the other side and not just focus on the metrics of, uh, you know, availability uptime for their servers, right? Like that should be an afterthought. That should be assumed at this point in kind of the SaaS world. And so I think it's something that we can push towards, but I don't think it's something that is, like it's not something that's going to be written in first time, um, but you need to push for it because you're on the hook if something goes down in your organization. Cool. Thanks. So our final tip that you can see here is about monitoring and measuring your applications. So once you move any of your applications to a SaaS model, or if you deploy an entirely brand new SaaS application, it gets a lot harder to measure success. So for example, if you move an application like Office to the Office 365 model, you are gonna see a lot more latency on your network. Um, so measuring and monitoring means that you would know those numbers before and after deployment, and you'll have a sense of what's acceptable for your users and what's not, and um, start get some more insight into what users are actually experiencing. Um, if you're managing remote locations, measuring performance is essential to know the general baseline for a particular office. So you can tell when something is wrong without having to actually be there. Um, 
And having a handle on sort of normal performance numbers helps to improve end user experience. Um, in that case, you really know when a user complaint could indicate a serious issue in one of your networks or with a provider. Um, having those hard numbers available also helps when you're talking to the higher ups at your company or you know, department heads or business leaders who are sort of just using anecdotal evidence to tell you that there's a problem or um, making decisions based just on maybe what they've heard from a few people. So another um, something we hear from customers a lot is some great stories about those customers showing a provider that the problem is actually on their end using the data from that they've gotten from MapNeta. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, so, you know, honestly, I've been surprised by some of our customers that we have that, that we're not tracking this data before using AppNeta. Uh, and that's not to say that our software will track ticket volume or response time, but it will help you reduce these times and focus your teams on root cause earlier in the process. So the first stage of improving something is always measuring it. Uh, so measure ticket volume, response time, your mean time to resolution. Uh, you know, we at Epnota will focus on the networking network metrics that you need to identify those issues. And so I'll go through, a, you know, a bunch of these that you should be paying attention to. Uh, capacity is something we talk about a lot here. Uh, looking at the end-to-end -end capacity of your network links uh, from the perspective of total capacity, available capacity utilized, uh, it can really illuminate where net net network bottlenecks are affecting user experience. So this often, uh, you know, this is often kind of a moment of education for people because bottlenecks really determine the end user experience uh, and other monitoring companies and uh, traditional monitoring technologies revolve around uh, bandwidth and throughput, but it's a single link that one person is experiencing and, and that can be the problem, right? It's, it's the routers that they're traversing that's gonna be the problem. So, you know, maybe the problem isn't in your office and you know, much of the time it probably isn't, uh, but it could be in the open internet, could be in the SaaS provider, uh, you know, there are a lot of other places where that could be the bottleneck, and that's what you want to be tracking, uh, not, you know, the bandwidth at your ISP egress point. So latency is, uh, you know, obviously a relatively easy one. Uh, I'll mention it mainly because it's an early warning indicator, and when comparing it to something like RTT, you can determine if the upload or download is slow, indicating kind of separate network paths uh, through, you know, an asynchronous internet, uh, and, you know, that's pretty common to be able to see differences there. Data loss or packet loss comes into play a lot because of uh, the low tolerance for loss in apps like voice and video conferencing. Uh, Epneta tracks voice traffic actually separately due to the differences in protocols, packet sizing. Uh, and so offices monitoring voice can compare to determine VoIP specific issues with something that may be a data specific issue. Uh, jitter is another you know, kind of metric that's an important one to look at from both a data perspective and a voice and video perspective. Uh, so essentially, you know, talking about, you know, TCP versus UDP uh, traffic or RTP traffic, you know, the, varia the variations in both uh, can indicate specific network issues and root causes in which, you know, the bad performance in one isn't always indicative of the performance in another. And so that's something that we definitely want uh, people focusing on. And I think end-to-end -end QoS levels are also something you'll want to keep a constant eye on. Uh, traffic with the wrong designation can cause a lot of performance issues. Uh, Everyone here should probably be, uh, you know, intimately familiar with that, right? Uh, QoS honoring and metrics is, is something you should be looking at. But traffic with, you know, the wrong designation cause, uh, you know, a lot, if, especially if you're, it's, you know, kind of not always easy to attribute to uh, a source unless you're tracking it, you know, end to end or continuously. And at, you know, at Netas Diagnostics make this easy, right? We track QoS honor, uh, honoring uh, across your links to identify where, uh, and who demoted the priority of traffic. Maybe it's an ISP peer or it's, you know, somewhere in a software defined network that you want to check out. So, you know, that's some of the metrics that we talk about. And, you know, obviously the uh, the troubleshooting tools and kind of the, the steps that we do uh, are, you know, different than a lot of others, but the metrics are the, kind of the important part. So uh, maybe we should go to a higher level though, Christine, if you want to take it. Yeah, thank you. Um... So yeah, let's talk a little bit more about AppNeta at a higher level. So our solution does continuous monitoring with customizable alerts. So you see when anything along the application delivery path changes wherever that starts and ends. Our tool monitors right to the cloud or SaaS providers data center. So that makes a big difference for the IT teams that are using us. 
And the end-to-end -end nature of that monitoring means that users can see exactly where the problem is happening. So some of the great success stories we hear from customers is about how they've used AppNeta sort of beyond just monitoring to really modernize their IT teams. So a common thread through a lot of the conversations we have is that their IT team adopted SaaS apps and cloud and gradually or sometimes quickly lost the visibility that they used to have. That affected the help desk, that affected the experience of users. Um, and these companies have now used AppNeta to get back that visibility and lead the way on managing applications, especially when we're talking about multiple locations. So ultimately they're getting ahead of issues before users even notice them. So they are able to make infrastructure changes accordingly once they've pinpointed those issues. Cool, so I'll take a second just, I know we're running up against our time here, but uh, let's talk about the solution a little bit. Uh, the AppNeta Performance Manager has three pillars of monitoring, right? Starting from your offices, we monitor, monitor kind of the application usage through packet captures run through our deep packet inspection engine. Uh, and that categorizes traffic into buckets like business critical traffic or VoIP and ERP, uh, as well as something like recreational traffic, like social media, streaming video. Uh, note, this is not NetFlow, right? We capture 100% of your traffic, we'll identify over 2,000 applications, give you custom ones that aren't based on command line, uh, and we're also going to group these by social media or group them by some kind of type so that you can actually set an alert on social media, not set an alert on Instagram or Twitter traffic, right? So it can be a, a, just much smarter in that sense. Um, you know, going counterclockwise, uh, our core technology lies within our application delivery monitoring. Uh, delivery is an, an active and continuous monitoring tool. It tracks the top metrics you need for troubleshooting, just like we talked about it a second ago, latency, jitter, loss, QoS, capacity. Uh, you know, and it's also smart, right? It starts with 30 to 50 packets per minute, uh, which is really low overhead when you compare it against a lot of the flooding tools out there and it's going to auto escalate to confirm any issues it finds. If it sees deviation in something like loss, it's going to up the number of packets, make sure it wasn't just a route change or a blip on the network. Uh, once we've confirmed the issue, the solution will begin a diagnostic automatically, which will look at the application delivery path hop by hop and end to end to gather as much data as possible to identify root causes of the issue. And it actually compares that data with our analysis tool in 88 common networking problem definitions. And then by the time you're logging into the software, by the time the alert's there, it's already gathered more data. And lastly, at the top, we have application experience, which uses Selenium-based synthetic scripting to benchmark and test your SaaS and web apps from the client perspective, looking at the network transport, client processing, browser rendering time. Uh, these aren't just simple pings though. They're not just availability checks. Uh, you can build, they can be built basically to mimic real user behaviors like logging in, requesting data, chart loads to identify where and when users will experience slowdowns. Uh, and you know, that's a little bit of a whirlwind tour. And I hope I touched anything or anything and everything. Um, but if you want to get in touch, you can get in touch with me here uh, or subscribe to updates on our blog and Twitter. Uh, or even better, go try out the demo environment, uh, tryfmeta.com. We'll drop you into a short guided tour of the product and then leave you with read-only access to the demo environment to explore and kind of learn on your own. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, do we have any other questions that have come in or anything else we want to address? Yeah, so we are, we are a little bit over time, so I just have one quick question that I want to get to here. Um, and the question is, if you do find a network issue, can you point, pinpoint which device is the root cause? Yeah, so we actually do that a couple different ways. So I mentioned, you know, hop by hop. Really, that's that's basically every router, every switch between you, uh, every firewall. So anything that's going to respond to kind of the network, the the traffic that we're sending, right? ICMP, UDP, TCP traffic, um, all of those things are going to give us some data, and so we can identify who is responding, uh, which metric is going down, so we can figure out which device it is. Uh, we also collect SNMP data when we detect an issue. So uh, those of you who are coming from kind of the SNMP world, we'll focus on making sure that if you own it, if you you know if you have the community string for a device, we're going to go try all those devices, try to gather the, you know a full MIB walk, try to get everything from the device at the time of the issue, uh, so that you can correlate that with our performance data. Cool, thank you. And we actually do, we have one more question that I love this question, so I just want to get this in because um, it's a good big, big picture one. So most, if not all, of the NG firewalls already do deep packet inspections. They're able to log and provide detailed reports. So what's the compelling reason why a customer would, would want AppNeta instead of another kind of solution like that? 
Yep. I mean, so, you know, packet capture and deep packet inspection is, is one component of this entire solution. And I think it's a really important one. And I, you know, seeing other companies, specifically hardware vendors, go and start putting DPI engines uh, is great. Uh, the, the thing about, you know, the firewall is the firewall also has to do a lot of other work. So you are putting something on the firewall that is going to take up some processing power. Sure, we have enough at this point. So that's not a compelling reason. But the compelling reason from our side is that uh, you can get that data in your office. Um, but once traffic goes outside your office, you lose that visibility. You can't use SNMP monitoring. You can't use uh, deep packet inspection to look at packets as they traverse the entire network. So you need some kind of active technology to go on the WAN, to go in between you and your data center, between you and your other offices, between you and your SaaS providers, and into the SaaS provider networks. And that's where kind of our delivery side, and that's where our correlation with usage gets it gets kind of to the root issue, right? Knowing what app is kind of is the problem is probably going to be reported to you or probably going to be something you can alert on uh, but then knowing the performance of that over a link to something else you care about to a SaaS app that you care about that's where we really want people to start focusing because bgp data is not really going to do it snmp data can't do it right you have to have some kind of thing on the line and being able to correlate dpi is great Right. I, I have no problem with you using DPI from a firewall. Um, we're going to collect 100 percent of the data. So make sure that's not sampling. I'm not familiar with the, the technical details of NG firewalls, but like make sure it's everything and make sure you're correlating it with your network data. Perfect. Thanks. I think that's a great note to end on. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Like we mentioned before, you'll get all the slides in your email. Um, probably later today, if not tomorrow. And you can also find this entire recording on our website. So thanks again, everyone, and have a good rest of your day.